welcome to The Conversation. I'm your host, Tiffany Smith. We've got a great show for you tonight with the local Arnold Air Society Squandred here to talk about their joint national service project. Then, after the break, the president of the Advocates for Free Thought and Skepticism will be here to talk about the nature of secularism on college campuses. And finally, we've got an overview of the government shutdown. But first, the news from last week. So the government got shut down recently. Yeah, that was a big deal. It was also Trump's anniversary on Monday, so we assumed Trump was like, honey, look, I got off work. Luckily, they passed a stopgap bill later Monday, so now Congress can get back to unofficially being deadlocked as opposed to officially. Attorney General Jeff Sessions has cracked down on state's legalization of pot, reversing an Obama-era decision to be hands-off with the uh, with enforcing the federal law banning the substance. Attorney General Sessions was quoted as saying that it's time for a return to the rule of law, which are words he may have wished to back down from when Robert Mueller came knocking on his door to talk Russia. Recently, the Pope w has condemned fake news, comparing it to Satan in Genesis. I had no idea that Satan was Russian. Recently, according to a Business Insider article, a Taco Bell in Alabama burned down recently. This was followed as it could only be by a candlelight vigil with over 100 attendees. We heard the conversation assume that the food's taste remained unchanged. Don't go too far, we've got our first guests who are two members of the Arnold Air Society talking about their joint national project concerning the prevention of sexual assault, trafficking, and abuse. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're here today with Arnold Air Society, a charitable organization through the AFROTC program. Today we have in the studio Taylor Gibson and Kate McKee. Hello, welcome to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to start the conversation off with um, you guys just giving us a brief overview of what your organization is and what it does. Sure. Um, so Arnold Air Society is a professional honorary service organization, and it's kind of an extracurricular club that falls under Air Force ROTC. And so by professional, we mean that there are many opportunities for not only professional networking, um, but to incur more duties and responsibilities with the job that you'll have that's Arnold Air Society specific in addition to your Air Force ROTC responsibilities. Um, honorary, it's a completely voluntary organization. And um, by service organization, we mean that we try to have a lot of opportunities for interaction with the community and um, national service projects. And what exactly are your guys' <coughs> positions um, within this organization and what do you guys do? Yeah, so uh, I am the assistant officer for the Joint National Project, which is a project that is community service oriented, uh, focusing on the larger picture of our whole nation. 
Cool. And I'm the public affairs officer. And um, so I'm actually very new at this position, um, just to get on at the beginning of this term. Um, but kind of the main goal of my position is to reach out to um, community groups that are local or even maybe more far reaching um, that could use kind of our assistance and things. Awesome. And is there a specific way you guys go about this or how you, um, how you kind of get started on each year's um, goal? Yeah, so with my position being uh, involving the Joint National Project, that is something that is determined every March. So every March we will start a new project. And that is something that my uh, supervisor and I focus on throughout the whole year until the next year when we switch um, into the next project. Um, what drove you guys to get involved with this organization? Um, I found the idea of Air Force ROTC being more involved within our local community and just having opportunities um, for community service to be really interesting. And I loved the community service part of it as well. Also through that, there are plenty of opportunities for professional development um, and also to earn scholarships, um, both for your tuition here at Oregon State or for things that can help you in your Air Force career, such as a pilot's license. Um, and are there any other organizations that you guys work in conjunction with or that um, maybe help along the same path towards um, your ultimate mission or your goals? Yeah, so with the Joint National Project for this next 2018 year, um, beginning in March, we are starting a new um, project to end the cycle of domestic abuse, and we are definitely looking to get involved with other organizations in our community. Right now, we're still researching and looking at organizations that could use our help. So we're looking at um, organizations both on campus and off campus in Corvallis, also in the wider state of Oregon. We are definitely looking for the opportunity to engage with our community and work in conjunction with them for that project. And do you guys have specific ways that you try and engage with the community or reach out to other individuals that are looking to get involved um, or if there's other organizations that have the same mission? Yeah, so with Arnold Air Society, there is a civilian component called Silver Wings, and we actually don't have one here in Corvallis currently, but that is one of the big things we're focusing on this year is trying to get that started up again. So the more interest we have in people helping us, we can more easily start this civilian chapter of Arnold Air Society called Silver Wings. Um, then they can work with us on the joint national project and basically do everything we do from a civilian standpoint. Wonderful. And how do people get involved with um, the Arnold Air Society? So if you're in Air Force ROTC, you go through a candidate class process. There is um, knowledge testing and an initiation process after the group comes together to create and carry out a, their own service project. Um, after that, you're a full-fledged member. Um, as for the civilian side of it, once we get the Silver Wings chapter going, people can contact us at the Air Force ROTC detachment here on campus. We also have a Facebook page, um, OSC Badly Squadron, if you want to check that out. Um, we're always open to hearing messages about um, possible community service groups that could be looking for our help. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for coming in to talk to us about the Badly Squadron and your Joint National Service Project. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Stay tuned after the break. We've got Shreyans Kunteta from the Advocates for Free Thought and Skepticism here to talk about secular spaces on campus. Hello, thank, thank you, you for having me on the show.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Sitting today with us is the president of the Advocates for Free Thought and Skepticism group here at Oregon State University, Mr. Trans Kunteta. Mr. Kunteta, welcome to the conversation. It's good to have you on. Good to be conversating. Awesome. Um, so if we could just start off with you explaining exactly what your club is and its mission. All right, so Advocates for Free Thought and Skepticism is the only Oregon State sponsored uh, group for skeptics, free thinkers, atheists, agnostics, and so on. We're also like, I think, the only skeptics group within 50 miles of here, or at least we were last year. Uh, we're basically a queer friendly space where people can talk about philosophical and political issues. Uh, last week our meeting was about the uh, free will and whether it exists or whether it doesn't. Uh, we've also talked about gun control, we've talked about um, other political issues such as abortion, and we'll be talking about a lot more which are bound to piss people off. Um, Something else that we do is that we also have events, and some of those events can be things like uh, Skeptics in the Pub, which is a sort of a fun event that we do every now and then, where we all go to make minimums, and we hang out, and we eat food, and we chat, and it's a good way to get to know each other. And then we have more serious events, like two years ago, we did a mental health open mic, where we had people come up and read stories, poems, or just describe their own experiences of mental health and the stigma around that, which is a conversation that doesn't get addressed as often. So in general, we take like um, issues that are going around and we look at them from a skeptical point perspective and try to understand why they exist and how to do good with that. Okay. Um, so for our viewers, can you explain exactly what it means to be a um, skeptic and especially in terms of your club? So basically, it just means that you don't take anything necessarily at face value, you try to understand the reasonings behind things. Like, it could be something like religion, like where you look at your the beliefs that you were raised with and the society you were raised with and try to understand why you hold those beliefs, whether those beliefs are actually valid, who is affected by those beliefs and why. Or it could be like you see a scientific study on Facebook which claims that if you drink like this one thing that you'll like bones will be like twice as powerful or whatever and then you go wow that seems amazing but is that actually true and then you look into it beyond just the clickbait and then you come out of it a more informed person it's also a way to be able to know like if you see a article which is like the Pope endorses Trump and then you go I don't think that's exactly true it's a skeptical perspective and worldview that you should carry in with like all aspects of your life Gotcha. Thank you for the explanation. Mm -hmm. um, could you all explain uh, your role with the club as well as what exactly that means and what you do? So I'm the president of the club, and there are uh, I'm not the only board member. There are three other board members, uh, uh, Lindsay, Hunter, and Emily are their names. And we, what we do is that we discuss amongst ourselves about the th topics that we're going to discuss, the events we're going to have. Um, I typically end up leading meetings, so when meetings happen, I'm the person who's making sure everybody gets time to speak, that everybody's voice is accounted for, that the conversation keeps moving. Um, I also manage the social media of AFS. Uh, we tend to be pretty big on social media. Our group is uh, quite large, and I'm also the person who makes sure that we create the events and that people actually go to them. Um, would you consider OSU and the surrounding community um, a supportive community regarding your club? Yeah, in general, like we have not had problems with the community. We've sometimes had events like Ask an Atheist Day, where people are baffled that atheists exist, um, and then they ask questions about that, and then we explain them, and then they usually walk away from that going, huh, I never thought about it that way. Um, in general, the community is very supportive. We also have pretty good relationships with the religious clubs on campus. We've done events with crew which is one of the Christian groups uh, here at Oregon State. And so we've never really had any problems with the community. Uh, they've supported us and we support them. Um, it sounds like um, you do cover some controversial topics, however. Um, have you received any backlash um, from any community members or other organizations? Um, not particularly, not about our group specifically. Sometimes you have uh, street preachers come onto campus and then they will be very, very angry that we exist, but they tend to be angry about a lot of things anyway. Um, and we have a way of dealing with that. Which I have right here. We have the OSU Angry Street Preacher Bingo. Would yeah. you like to kind of explain this a little bit more for our viewers? Yeah, definitely. So Street Preacher Bingo is just a really fun way to make these street preachers very upset. So like, um, for example, if you look at that card right there, it'll have all sorts of different uh, top, basically it's a bingo sheet. And so if a street preacher says one of the things on the bingo sheet, you can cross that out as a space. And then once you get a full bingo, you basically get candy. We at AFS will be there watching the event go on and then we'll give you candy. There are 
things on that bingo sheet, such as if the street preacher says you're going to hell, which they always say, you'll be able to mark that off. If they bash Darwin, you can mark that off. If they make a logical fallacy, you can mark that off. And then the goal is just to get a bingo. And it's a really good way to engage with the preachers because the street preachers are here. They're funded by a national organization, which sends these guys out here so they cause trouble. They're not here for a valid rational debate. They just want to get footage that they can put on YouTube of college students getting really angry and upset. And then they can put it up on YouTube with the caption, triggered college students attack religion on our campus. <laughs> and then that spreads like wildfire amongst a lot of groups. And then they keep getting money. And then they can keep out and they can keep trolling people. So instead, just troll them back. Right on. Well, that sounds like a very healthy way to get something as unhealthy as candy, which I love. <laughs> Um, so you definitely do question a lot of people, not in a negative sense, but just try and push them out of their comfort zone. Yeah. Um, what values do you see in people questioning their own faith? So I think that if you question your own faith, you come out of it with a better understanding of your own faith. Like, if you grew up as a Christian, then you get more out of Christianity if you believe it because you can logically back up why you believe it. Like you've gone, I have looked at my faith, I have looked at the institutions surrounding my faith, I've thought about how my faith impacts me and society, whether that's a positive force or a negative force, and if after that you still believe it, then you have a valid reason to believe it. But at the same time, if you grew up as a Christian and you do that analysis and you decide that you can't justify it to yourself, then there is a safe uh, group for you to be around people who aren't just that way. In fact, like, um, so I've kept the Facebook page pretty active, and so we post a lot of like uh, religious things or anti-religious things, and then there was this person who said, hey, who hadn't joined the club for a while, but he followed the page, and then once he finally showed up to a meeting, he was like, you know, I had been questioning whether I was an atheist or not, and I was kind of scared to come out and say it because I grew up in a really conservative Christian background, but your page helped me like be more comfortable with that because I realized that there wasn't just me who thought that way. And I was just like, well, I didn't know my memes were that effective, but all right, man, that's great. <laughs> um, so uh, finally, how do people get involved with your club? Um, when and where do you meet? So we meet at Milam 318 at 5 p.m. on Fridays. Uh, that's basically our meeting time. It's almost always our meeting time. Sometimes we'll go out to make minimums, but we will post on our Facebook page that we're doing that. And our Facebook page is easily found. It's just Advocates for Free Thought and Skepticism. You go to the Facebook search bar, you type it in, and you'll find us uh, apply to join, and I will approve you. Yeah. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Mr. Kunteta, for joining us today and telling us about your club and its mission. Yeah, definitely. We'd love to have you on again sometime. Yeah, I'd love to. And definitely show up to a meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next up, we've got an overview of the recent federal government shutdown. Stay tuned.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Here on The Conversation, we strive to create sincere, fair, and informed dialogue. In order to tackle a variety of concepts, the format of this show will change week to week. We are regularly going to have a segment where we take an issue or topic and give a brief but detailed description of it in order to help inform our viewers about the world around them. I'd like to introduce you to our informative section, The Overview. Today on The Overview, we'll be talking about the recent government shutdown with such a politicized government. It's important to know how our government shuts down and why. Um, before we do, we're going to have to talk a little bit about their incredibly exciting world of government funds allocation. Federal government spending is broken into three parts. First is mandatory spending. This is the money that the U.S. government is obligated to allocate and is not affected by the annual budget. This spending is mostly on entitlements such as Social Security and other welfare programs. Mandatory spending takes up about 62% of our national federal budget. The second component is called discretionary spending. This is the spending that the annual budget has control over. Discretionary spending takes up about 29% of our total budget. Um, the third part is the remaining around 9%, which is mandatory interest on our loans. The reason for a government shutdown is if Congress cannot decide on how to spend its discretionary spending. You see, federal spending is allocated like this. Usually the president will send in a budget to Congress. This budget is a suggestion. Congress can accept it, change it, or throw it out completely. The real budget is made by Congress later and is then signed by the president into action. Congress creates this budget of discretionary spending to dictate things such as education, Medicare, energy, transportation, defense, and more. The political parties which control Congress usually have different views about which parts of discretionary spending will go where. Every year, Congress must pass this budget in order for the federal government to continue to function. Additionally, the president is obligated to spend all of the money allocated by Congress in the period for which the budget takes effect. If Congress is unable to pass a budget, then the federal government will shut down. Now, this means something different for different departments. Things deemed as essential services will remain in operation. This includes departments like the Department of Defense and the Department of Justice, albeit some in reduced capacities. Other departments, such as the Department of Agriculture or Education, will see a large furlough or temporary leave granted to many of their employees. Additionally, many of the departments themselves are often closed, such as national parks, during the 2013 government shutdown back during the Obama administration. Furloughed employees usually receive back pay for duration of the shutdown. The shutdown will only affect non-furloughed members' um, pay if said shutdown extends into a new pay period. The federal government shutting down is usually seen as a breaking down of the discourse within Congress. People often cite such events as evidence that the United States is becoming more and more politically entrenched and that there are less people trying to reach across the aisle to communicate with members of opposing viewpoints. In the current situation, the main issue around which the government has shut down this time is the provisions around the protection of illegal immigrants raised in the United States, or DREAMers as they are called. With Republicans claiming the fault in Democrats and Democrats claiming fault in the Republicans, majority of their answer is, as we will find out often on this show, too subtle, uh, subtle, complex, and too long for our short little show. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us here on The Conversation. From everyone here at the studio, we'd like to wish you a good night.